I'm not even going to attempt to answer. I just don't know how to, I don't have a better answer better than just look at that example again. Um, I really don't. I don't have a really, really inner feeling as to the difference. And I might one day, and then I'll try. And, and it, it's like a teacher's, a teacher's worst <laughs> I was talking to Patrick Winston about this. He goes, you know, whenever you go to a class, you always tend to have this disease that you never feel you have enough. You know, you, and that happens when you think about something for 20 years. It starts to seem easy, and you feel like, well, I'm going to be done in 10 minutes. So you prepare more, and then if you don't catch yourself and have a little self-awareness, you'll lose it completely. And it's like, one day I will finally get an idea, and then I will be, like, compelled to have everybody understand it in one afternoon. <laughs> and it'll just be, I really don't, I really don't have a, anything to say, and I wish I did. I just don't have a nice explanation. These, these, these machines are not universally aware. They don't have to deal with the That's right, right, right. That, world of truth. That's a nice thing to think, right, right. They certainly only deal with themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, we're not talking about a collection of people in the city, and that one person knows everything about all the other people in the city. We're talking more that any particular person in the city is allowed to know a lot about themselves, but maybe not a lot about everyone. everyone. So I think that's, that's a nice way to put it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Except that the problem was with the self-knowledge. Yes, the problem with this, right, right. The problem with knowing about everybody is self-knowledge. But if you don't insist on knowing everything, then it's okay to have a little self-knowledge. <laughs> I guess that's the, the moral. Uh, a little stuff now is a good thing. All right, um, good. Tom's here, so he's still taking pictures of me, right? Uh, I want to I wanna finish with this topic, and, and I'll give you copies of all these things that I have, and I'll let you look at them and play around with them. But I want to do one more short topic before we go, and it's something you've seen before, and the only reason I'm doing it is because it's just really cool, and I don't have to get into too many details about it. So I promise I never put the picture on the board again, but I'll just put this one word on the board. Imagine the picture's there, and one of the, one of the rings says peace space on it. <laughs> And remember I told you that P space e equals a time, alternating time, that's polynomial. So if you have polynomial time algorithms, but they work on alternating Turing machines, that takes us all the way to P space. Non-determinism takes us out of P into NP, and alternating, the next step up, takes us up to P space. Nice little jumps. There's something else that P space is equivalent to a class that I haven't talked about at all. It's really an advanced topic, but Mike Sipser talked about it when he was here. So I'll be able to remind you fairly quickly. I won't go into any formal details about this class. I'll just give you an example of how you compute things in this class. And then I'm going to tell you the theorem that this class, which is called Interactive Protocol, that this class called IP, is exactly the same as P-space. And that's just the kind of results theoreticians love. Somebody makes up this weird class hopes it's a natural class to make up, and somebody else shows that it's exactly the same as another class we've been talking about that has a natural meaning. This is a very wonderful theorem, and it's a long one. It's about 10 pages in the book. So I won't convince you of this theorem, but I do want to tell you what IP is. So you know what P space is. You know what A time poly is. P space is deterministic algorithms that use polynomial space. A time poly are polynomial time algorithms that use alternating Turing machines. Interactive protocol is not at all like any computation you've had so far. It's not exactly deterministic. It's not exactly non-deterministic. It's a conversation. We compute things by having a conversation. Now, non-determinism in some ways is like this. In non-determinism, we have a very short conversation. Say I want to figure out 3SAT. How do I solve 3SAT non-deterministically? Who remembers? What do you do? You make a guess as to what? What do you guess? A truth value for every single variable. So let's think that, let's say that's your part of the conversation. Erica picks true and false for all the variables, and then she sends that message to me. And I got this letter from Erica, and I'm opening up really eagerly, and in it is nothing but true and false values. And I go, <laughs> and then I look at it, and I say, well, I wonder what she's doing with her life, but let's at least check whether this formula is satisfiable. So I look at the formula, and I check the true false values against my formula, and it works out. And I write her back a letter, and I go, thanks. Now I know this is satisfiable. And then she sends me a note the next day with another true-false uh, assignment for a different formula that I had sent her. And that one doesn't work out. You know, I go, can you please try again? But she can certainly convince me that it's satisfiable when it is. 
All she has to do is guess a way to do it, and I can evaluate that in polynomial time. So my job is a polynomial time evaluator or verifier. And her job, I don't know how she does it, she has superpower, you know, I don't measure how much time she takes. Her job is to convince me of these things. Think of non-determinism that way, and you'll understand a little bit about interactive protocols. Interactive protocols are the same kind of thing, except there's some randomness involved, and there's a back and forth that can go more than once. This is Sipser's lazy slave thing. That he exactly. Does. Right. It's the same thing. It's, it's not, you, you've heard it before if you were at the lecture, and if you weren't, you'll hear it now. Uh, what about the complement of three sets? I have a formula. And I want to know not whether it is satisfiable, but I want to know whether it's not satisfiable. Everyone understand the difference? And Erica's sitting at home, and she gets to send me these same messages, and I get to check them in polynomial time. How can she do it now? If she sends me a true-false set of values, and I check to make sure that they don't work, am I convinced that there's no assignment? No, because there might be some other one, so she'd have to send me another one. And another one. How many would she have to send me until I'm convinced that there's no three set? All of them. All two to the end. So despite the fact that she has tremendous power in picking these things, and she can, I don't measure how much time it takes her, but the protocol constrains us for this problem that I can't do it any better than two to the end time. She has to send me two to the end messages for me to be convinced. This problem is not in NP as far as anybody knows. Complements of NP is not closed under complement. This problem is NP, and this is not an NP. P is closed under complement, but not, th not NP. Can't, can't do complement of non-deterministic stuff, just like finite state machines. So Erica can't do this. So what people did is they said, well, why don't I just invent some way to improve the protocol and allow people to convince other people of things like this? And the best way to explain this protocol is to explain an example of a very famous problem called graph isomorphism. We talked about this once also. Graph isomorphism is a problem where you're given two graphs, g1, g2, and you're asked, <clears throat> can you place one on top of the other so that all the edges match up? Are they really the same graph for all intents and purposes? Can you relabel one so that it matches the other? Now, if you try to do that by brute force, deterministically, it takes n factorial steps. You have to try all n factorial ways of, of ordering the vertices and then checking the edges to see if they match. <coughs> but now we'll do the same thing. Erica's a non-deterministic uh, prover and I'm the verifier or the evaluator. How could she convince me whether two graphs are isomorphic if they are? She guesses an ordering of one of them, sends it to me in order, and I compare it with my current ordering I have on the other. And if she's powerful enough to find the right guess, then I'm certainly powerful enough to check it in linear time, time proportional to the edges. So this is a problem that's in NP. Okay, you can guess it and check it. It's complement, just like the complement of 3 set is not in NP. If you want to convince me that two graphs are not isomorphic, you'd have to send me all the possible n factorial arrangements, and I'd have to check them all to make sure they don't work. Same as before, this is an NP, the complement's not an NP. You should know one really cool, interesting thing. Most problems that we've talked about are, when they're in NP are either, are, well, typically you try to show they're NP complete. Very often, you have a problem, either you stick it in, inside P, you show it's polynomial time, or you show it's NP complete. You don't like to leave problems sitting in open land. This problem has been in open land for at least 25 years. Nobody has any idea whether it's NP complete, Nobody has any idea how to do it in polynomial time. So it's one of the few problems that are not the hardest problems in NP. Almost all the problems in NP that we know of are at least as hard as all the others. This one might be easier as far as we know, but nobody knows. Wide open this problem. So it's reducible to NP complete problems, but not the other way around? That's right. This reduces to any NP complete problem, but not any NP complete problem reduces to it as far as we know. So it's at least, uh, they're all at least as hard as it, and we don't know if it's as hard as they are. But we think it is, just nobody's come up. I think this just shows that MP complete is a weak theory. It's not enough to get everything that's hard to do. There's other kinds of things that we await people to discover. All right, 
Let's think about the complement of this, because the complement of this problem is one where we can make up a protocol.